ask He. Now you ask He. And I will serve you. I will serve you. Give you everything. Give you everything. I will lift up my eyes to your throne. My eyes to your throne. And I will trust you. Trust you alone. Trust in you alone. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. I will give you all my worship. Give you all my praise. You alone I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise.
like to invite you all to stand if you're comfortable for our last songs. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight the highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saints, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, will be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus. Come, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice, all will be new, your name forever, faithful and true. Jesus is coming soon. Yes. 
a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so good, with every breath that I
rest, O hope, blessed rest of my soul. And Lord, haste the day when thy face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. Joy, new things. Or do you want everything to stay the same? In Isaiah chapter 43, begin reading at verse 19. God directs his prophet and he says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. This people I have formed for myself. They shall declare my praise." God said, I am going to do a new thing. September the 26th, 2021, God is saying, I will do a new thing. For this past week, it's been a very difficult week for some individuals. They've experienced a lot of pain, a lot of heartache. But God says, I want to do a new thing. God says, as I do that new thing, he says, the beasts of the wild are going to honor me. He says, I'm doing a new thing for the people that I have chosen. Do you understand? Can I comprehend the fact that God has chosen me? Scripture says that before time began, he predestined salvation for us. He's doing a new thing. When salvation comes, the old passes away. Behold, all things become new. We are a new creation. But he says, I'm going to do this so that my people praise me. So I'm trusting today as we have gathered together on this new day of September the 26th, that we will realize the new things that God wants to do in our lives. And as we experience those new things, we will give him praise. Shall we pray? God, we thank you so much for the privilege, the opportunity to live in this new day, this day which you have created and given to us, this day which you have set aside and we have gathered together in this place with your people to worship you. 
Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are a God whose mercies are new and fresh every day. Every morning we get to see the newness of your love. So Father, today we pray that once again you would touch us, you would speak to us, you would open our eyes to see the new things that you are doing. And may we give you honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time we'll ask her. 524. <clears throat> Five hundred and twenty four in the Christian hymnal, the haven of rest. Oh, my soul, the sad exile was down on my sea, so burning with sin and distress, till I Yeah. 
be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. Yeah. 
moved first, and the second one is God of all my days. <clears throat>
pursues. I hear from you, haunted by my failures, and found the God whose grace still covers me. Spirit through the church to call Darren Peachy to serve as overseer of the Nomberg congregation. The Conservative Mennonite Conference prescribes the following duties for an overseer. To assist the congregation in giving vision to its life and ministry. To serve as a pastor to the pastors. To perform the duties of a bishop if necessary. And to encourage the pastor and the congregation to work diligently to develop wholesome relationships within the congregation and with Mennonite, conservative Mennonite conference. Brother Darren, are you willing to accept the call to serve as overseer of this congregation, to accept the responsibilities which this office requires, and to be faithful in working for the welfare of this congregation? Sister Karen. Are you willing for your husband to accept this responsibility of overseer and to support him in it? As a congregation, you have called Brother Darren to serve as your overseer. Are you willing to support him in prayer, to be open to receive and give counsel, and walk together in brotherly love in behalf of the church and for God's glory? You may express your affirmative response by standing. Brother Darren, in recognition of the congregation's call to you and your acceptance of the call, we hereby charged you with the responsibilities of overseer of this congregation. May the Lord grant you grace, wisdom, and love to faithfully discharge your responsibilities as overseer and to serve effectively for the welfare of the pastor and this congregation. Shall we pray? Father God, this morning we give you thanks that you are the shepherd of this congregation, 
that it is Jesus Christ who is the head of the church. But Father, this morning we also thank you for Brother Darren and Sister Karen. We thank you for their willingness to use their gifts, their talents, their time in this position as being overseer for this congregation. Father, we pray that you might bless their efforts. Father, we pray that you would give them the wisdom and the love that they need to serve in this capacity. And Father, we just pray for us as a congregation that we will support Brother Darren and Sister Karen in the responsibility that they have called them to, that we will continue to remember to lift them up in prayer, not only as overseer of this congregation, but also as a conference pastor for Conservative Mennonite Conference. So Father, we pray your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I say, at the fellowship hour or after church, we hope that you will be able to greet them and let them know your names and a little bit about, uh, about yourself to them. May God bless you. God, we thank you for this service today. We thank you for everything that has been shared and how that you are at work in this congregation. You are building your kingdom. And Father, this morning we thank you for Brother Darren. We thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to have him here as our overseer. We thank you for what he has already shared with us as a leadership team. And Father, we thank you this morning for what you have laid upon his heart to share with us as a congregation. Father, may he speak without fear or favor of men. May we receive your word with thanksgiving and joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, brother. Well, good morning, church. You are a good looking bride. You're the bride of Christ, and for some reason, for the last number of months, I just keep thinking how the bride of Christ is being prepared to walk down the aisle and meet Jesus, and we sang about that this morning. And so all, all, the, all the, the joys of life, the wrestling of life, the struggles of life are all preparing us. Uh, I, just, I just love the picture of how a bride just gets gets ready and walks down the aisle to meet the groom and that's it's what the hap, it's what's happening with the church and we're all at different places in that preparation but Jesus loves his church and he is preparing us to meet him I wrote an article for the September Harmonizer, which gave you a lot of details about us. And so if you haven't read that and you want to know more about us, Karen and I, you can, you can look at that. But Titus, Titus talked about my title as conference pastor and, and overseer at Nomberg. Uh, they're all kind of cool, but I really like titles like being a husband to Karen, being a father, to two children and a, grandcho- or a grandfather to six children. I spent a lot of years dairy farming. Uh, I like to archery hunt. I love following after Jesus because he's done so much for me. So those are the titles that I, I really relish, but, but I'm okay with, with being your overseer, and we'll figure out together what all that looks like and what that means. I do want to thank the youth for that meal on Friday night. That, you guys know how to do pork. That was really good. So thank you. Um, that was a, a nice way to, to start the weekend. I do want to say that I don't take the, the responsibility of serving as your overseer lightly. And the reason is you belong to Jesus. Jesus paid the price for you to be a part of his church. And because of that, uh, I take my, my, ro- my role and my responsibility seriously. 
had several opportunities over the last day and a half or so to meet with your leaders, and, and out of that, just appreciated their trust and just blessing me to kind of share with you this morning whatever I felt that the Lord was laying on my heart to share with you. And so out of, out of some of their dis, those discussions uh, Friday evening and, and yesterday, um, I just want to draw our attention to, to several things that we talked about. One is, is and, and Myron brought it up, we talked about the importance of, of water baptism and the value of that and for persons that have entrusted themselves to Jesus and the resurrected life that comes from faith in Jesus and his, and his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension and, and Jesus is now interceding for us and and so we talked about the importance of water baptism, and, and we also talked about church membership and the meaning of that. And, and some folks closely tie baptism with membership church in, a, in a specific church, and, and others don't see it quite that closely. And, and I, just, I just sense a desire to wrestle with that and to study the Scriptures and, and recognize that as brothers and sisters study the scriptures, we may come out on slightly different ways of practically living that out. And, and we've got to learn to be okay with that and learn how to be brothers and sisters. And uh, so yeah, just it's a great discussion about, about some of that. Another thing we talked about was, was leadership transition. That's a, an area of importance for you as a church to be praying about. Brother Titus has shared that I think it's what, January 24. Um, I can still remember when 2000 came, and now we're talking about 24. That, that his desire is to, to be retired as senior pastor. And now that's not tomorrow, but it's not that far away. So it's something to be thinking about as a congregation and praying about. So I encourage you to, to pray for your leadership council as they begin giving consideration to the next season of leadership here at Nomberg. And we also spent some time sharing together in regard to, to some of the pain and the hurts and confusion related to the, to the differing views and understandings of the, I don't know what it's been, the past two and a half years associated with, um, or kind of surrounding the Leadership Council and the Missions Council and the Ministry of, of Sunlight Missions. And, and just recognizing that some of the uncertainty and lack of clarity has led to some distrust and misunderstandings and people, some of you as a, a church family, being confused. And that's, that's begun to impact our, our families and our, and our friends, and for some so, so deeply, and it's been so difficult that they've chosen to to uh, find fellowship in, in other church families for a time of rest and healing. And we just have to acknowledge that that's the case. And um, those are painful decisions. And, and then there's some of you that are like, you don't even really know what's going on and you're confused and confused by the tensions associated with that. And uh, just, just allow me to explain a couple things as I understand them. Your missions council is responsible to know and know about uh, the missions that, that your church um, supports. And, and you've been talking a little bit about that this morning with Beaver Camp. Also, I want to just point out that Sunlight Missions is not a legal entity of Nomberg Mennonite Church. It's its own entity. It's a para-affiliate of CMC, which basically means uh, they're part of they kind of come under CMC's umbrella for a place of accountability and support. But we also need to recognize that Sunlight Missions is very intertwined with Nomberg Church. The founders, board members, large numbers of supporters are part of, of Sunlight Missions. They're also part of Nomberg Church, so we have to recognize that. But, but legally, as far as the way things are formed, it's not a part of the Nomberg Church. Recently, I don't know, it's been a few months ago, um, 
After some ongoing conversations this winter, CMC sent the Sunlight Mission Board some recommendations for the board to think about on ways that they can, you know, kind of increase accountability and transparency. And so there's ongoing conversation about those things. And, and I say all that to say, um, you know, over the last two and a half years, in, in our times of, of sharing together, uh, I was invited by, by CMC and your leadership team to come alongside and begin to wrestle with some of these issues uh, that have been divisive and, and built tension in the, in the congregation. And as I've been involved with, with these conversations over the past year with your, with your pastors and with the Missions Council and the Sunlight Missions Board, individuals with the, within the congregation at large, I feel like we just need to recognize that at least in the foreseeable future, there will most likely not be any kind of consensus among those involved about all the facts and all the processes and about all the information that was or was not pr presented to the congregation. We're just not going to come to consensus on that. And, and we're just going to have to be okay with that. Um, what I do know and what I firmly believe that it's time for the Nongburg congregation to begin uh, getting refocused on the mission of being the church together, to being the bride together, be being the place that is entrusted with a commission from Jesus to go and make disciples and baptize and teach and, and knowing and, and understanding and believing that He, Jesus, will be with us with his church to the end of the age. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. Sometimes there's confusion. Sometimes we just have to agree that we're not going to all be on the same page and be willing to move forward as the body of Christ and be who God has called us to be. Is it, is it okay to say that this morning? Yes? Okay, great. Because I have a, a concern, a, a question, it's a question. It's a paragraph long question. I think it's the longest question I've ever written. So I'm just gonna read it. I mean, it's the longest sentence, one sentence question that I've ever written. Did you ever stop to think how dreadful and sad it would be, or is, that God sent Jesus to pay the price for sin on the cross, for Jesus to take on all the sin of the world, past, present, and future, and go into the grave, and rise from the dead, and ascend into heaven, and intercede at the right hand of the Father, and prepare a place we call heaven and everlasting life for all those who entrust themselves to Jesus, and he in turn entrusted his mission to those who believe in him, us, the church, and then we simply find it unnecessary or inconvenient, and so we ignore Jesus' commission and decide our neighbors, which includes other believers, are not worth loving with the same love that God poured into us as Jesus' followers. Did you ever think how sad that is? Well, I'd like to turn our attention this morning to kind of a little known, little referred to letter in the New Testament this morning. And it goes by the name of Philemon. It's probably one page in your Bible. And as I listen to the memory work this morning, I don't have to tell you that it's one page back from Hebrews. Sometimes people can't find Philemon. So if you go to Hebrews and turn back a page, you'll find it. And it's divided into 25 verses. It's nice and short. And... Uh, Actually, a lot of this, this story, I, lo I love how God orchestrates things. It's a story about a runaway. And what was the, where's Rick, is it Rick and Amy? Is that the right? Is that the right names? Ryan and Amber. Oh, okay, it was close, Ryan and Amber. <laughs> Your first song today that you, you sang was about, I'm a runaway, or it's about a runaway. And this story is about a runaway. And... Uh, I just love how God orchestrates things like that. 
So as we, as we think about Ryan and Amber, Ryan and Amber, right? Okay, all right. So as we think about the church and sharing our faith and, and living out the gospel, there's some truths we can learn from this little letter that are significant and relevant to the situations we find ourselves in. So before we get into reading the text, I just want to give you a little background on the main characters of the story and kind of the situations they're in. And then we'll read the text and see where we can find ourselves in the story. So there's three main characters. Um, and, and each have their own significance in the broader story. First, we have Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's, the, he's a one-time persecutor of the church. Did you ever think about that, how somebody who persecuted the church is now writing letters that are in the canon, in the Scripture? Um, are we okay with that? We better be, because that's the power of the gospel. Anyway, um, Paul had an encounter with Jesus and now identifies himself as a prisoner for the sake of Christ, and he's the one who wrote the letter. And, and when he wrote it, Paul was in Rome awaiting, or in house arrest, uh, awaiting trial. And it was from this, this less than glorious setting that, that he wrote what we now know as Colossians to the church in Colossae. And he also wrote this very personal letter to Philemon. And then he sent these two letters to, at the same time with the same travelers, one who was Onesimus, who we'll meet in a moment. And just to give us an understanding, Colossae was about a thousand miles from Rome, which is now present-day Turkey. And so there was no Pony Express, there was no click and send, you know, click send, and I mean, so he had to, he had to send a letter a thousand miles. So who is Philemon? Philemon's a Christian. He's a follower of Jesus. He's a church leader. And he owns slaves. Yes, you heard me right. Philemon was a Christian and he owned slaves and he was a leader in the church in Colossae and the church even met in his home. And Philemon was a, a close friend of the Apostle Paul and his life was changed forever when he became a Christ follower and most likely it was because of Paul's ministry of the gospel to him and his family. And then there's Aphia. Mentioned in verse 2, it was most likely, uh, Aphia was most likely Philemon's wife who would have had a big role in hospitality and hosting the church in their home. And then many people think that uh, Archippus was most likely Philemon's son. We don't really know for sure. But the point being that Paul knew this family well and he considered them to be good friends and he wrote them a very personal letter from prison. And then there's Onesimus, who we see come into play a little further along in the story. And while Philemon was a slave owner, Onesimus was a runaway slave. And to top it all off, he was owned by Philemon. It seems as though Onesimus, who worked in Philemon's household, stole something and then ran away. We could have that map picture. Somehow, by, by God's sovereign providence or some other design or, or plan that we're not privy to, Onesimus ran the thousand miles from Colossae to Rome. And you'll find Colossae just off to the, well, depending on which side you're sitting on, but it's just in present day Turkey. And I just put this, put this up to give us a picture. Uh, Onesimus ran across Asia Minor he ran across the Aegean Sea and Greece and the Adriatic Sea and Italy or, or possibly took the more southerly route the whole way along through the Mediterranean Sea and comes into contact with the good news proclaiming Apostle Paul who happens to be a good friend of Philemon, the very person who Onesimus is running away from. Don't you just love when stuff like that happens? Are you, are you getting the picture here? And, and Paul testifies of Jesus Christ to Onesimus, leads him to faith in Jesus, and Onesimus starts serving the church by caring for Paul in prison. You just can't arrange stuff like that, apart from God. Before we go any farther, there are some things we should know about slavery in the first century. 
the Roman Empire was built on slave labor. And, and whenever the Romans would, would conquer some new territory, they added new slaves to the Roman Empire. I've, I've actually read where, where Romans, rich Romans, uh, could have owned as many as 10,000 slaves personally. Slavery in the first century was so commonplace that no one even thought seriously to oppose it. There was little protection for slaves because they were regarded as property. Owners could mistreat or even kill their slaves with little worry of any legal repercussions. And the law of the day specifically provided that runaway slaves could be put to death. It's not a wonder that Onesimus ran and ran and ran for a thousand miles. This is part of the culture that the gospel of Jesus Christ is confronted with in the first century as Christianity spread across Asia Minor and Greece and Rome and on towards Europe. So, how did, how did Paul, how did the early church leaders begin to make inroads of cultural change? Was the, was the gospel going to change the culture or was the culture going to change the gospel? And you know what? At times, both happen, don't they? Well, these are some of the questions that we wrestle with today. What are the cultural issues, some that, that we don't even see because they're so commonplace, that need to be adjusted by the truth of the gospel? And how do those long, slow changes happen? We'll come back and try and answer those questions shortly. So let's reset. Paul now has two good friends. Both are believers. Both are followers of Jesus, who at one time lived in the same household, but are now at odds with each other because one had offended the other by stealing from him in his own house, and now one actually has legal rights according to the law of the day over the other. And now a thousand miles separates them, but, but Paul discerns it's time for these brothers to reconcile. It's time for teaching the church. It's time for bringing about social change. And he does it by appealing to love. And remember, love does not come from us. Love is a fruit of the spirit of Jesus who God pours into, God deposits into those who have surrendered by faith to Jesus. That's the background to this little letter that Paul wrote to Philemon. If you have your Bibles, I just want to take a few minutes and read through the letter. And I can just, I can just imagine Philemon's household sitting around in their house. Philemon, Theus, maybe Archippus, maybe a few other people. And they've got this letter that Onesimus brought back to them and said, hey, this is from Paul. He's over in Rome in prison. And here's this letter for you. And this is what he says. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. And I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. And your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the heart of the saints." Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in change. Paul is claiming Onesimus, this runaway slave, this thief, as his son. Formerly he was use, useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. <coughs> I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in change for the gospel. 
but I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you will do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was so that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but he is even dearer to you, both as a man and a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have come have some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaporis, Epaporis, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings, and so do Mark, and Aristarchus, and Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. I have to wonder what Philemon thought when they read that letter from Paul, his dear brother in the Lord who was in prison a thousand miles away. We don't know all the conversations that may have happened in an earlier time between Paul and his friend Philemon regarding how the living the Christian life and the owning of slaves is not really compatible. But we do know that in all of his writings in the New Testament, Paul never condemned slavery. Rather, he wrote about how slaves and masters should relate to each other. Now, that doesn't mean that the Apostle Paul approved of slavery. But think about it. What if, what if Paul would have just kept saying, slavery is wrong, slavery is wrong, slavery is wrong. It doesn't match up with God's de design and just kind of railing on that all the time. Just saying that doesn't provide any power to change the culture. Well, what does? Maybe just a little clue from, from the prophet, prophet Ezekiel. Over and over in Ezekiel, we, we, hear, we hear the word of the Lord saying, God saying, I will, I will, I will. I will cleanse you. I will purify you. I will make you clean. I will give you a new heart. I will give you a soft heart and take out your heart of stone. It's God who does those things. It's the power of God that begins to change the culture, and he does that through the church. We don't know how Paul shared the gospel with the runaway slave, with this thief Onesimus, in such a way that he believed. Believed that, that as a thief and as a slave that he had value as a person. And that, and that because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that he could call God, holy God, he could call him Abba, Father. And to actually understand that, that he was made new and forgiven for his thievery. And, and now he could actually risk enough to return to the person who had legal right to kill him and be reconciled. And we don't know what all Paul had in mind in, in sending Onesimus back to Philemon, but everything we know about the Apostle Paul, we know that he had the long view, the big picture of the gospel impacting the culture until the Lord Jesus Christ returns for his church. How do we know that? Because this is the same Apostle Paul who declares in Romans, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Could you say that with me this morning? I'll say it and you repeat it. If you believe it. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God. For the salvation 
of everyone who believes. Do we believe that? Do we understand that, church? That, that word salvation, if you kind of start getting to the roots of all the words, it, it means to live open and free, like a wideness. It's a surrender. I loved hearing Brother Al's testimony this morning. He's like, I was surrendered and I had a peace. It's that freedom, that openness of wideness of, I mean, you know people like that, right? Some of you are like that. Some of you want to be like that. Just, just live life with this joy and openness and peace. That's what salvation does. That's what the gospel does for us. You just said that. Sometimes, Brother Al, it takes us a while to get there, doesn't it? Being completely dependent on God, on Jesus, and not being ashamed of that. And you're not ashamed of that, are you? You gave testimony of that this morning. Amen. Well, back to our letter. Just a couple things I want to point out here this morning. First, Paul begins by appealing to grace. He starts and he ends this letter with an appeal to grace. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. And he finishes up the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've heard me preach in the last three years, you've heard me talk about grace. I wrestled with that word for a while and Several years ago, I came across a definition from an old Strong's uh, concordance. And I'm like, ah, that's it. It's divine influence in the heart that begins to reflect in the life. Grace from God, this divine influence that, that comes into us as believers and begins to reflect out of us. That's grace. It's something out of ourselves from God, comes into us, flows back out. You could almost exchange it for spirit because as the spirit comes in, the spirit fruits come out. Paul begins and ends this letter to Philemon with this appeal to grace. It's going to take divine influence reflecting in the life if these two brothers are going to reconcile together. And second thing I see is this appeal by Paul for Philemon to exercise his faith. Exercise, be active and living and sharing your faith. Philemon, Philemon, live like you believe that the power of the gospel is for salvation. Live like it. Exercise your faith. Do you know what actually happens when we exercise faith? Do you know what happens? Paul gives the answer. He says, he says, you will begin to have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. That's what happens, brothers and sisters, when we begin to exercise faith. I just, I'm going to go back to Al again. He exercised faith two weeks ago on Sunday. And he began to get a fuller understanding of every good thing he has in Christ. That's what happens when we exercise our faith. That's what Paul says. When we live by faith, we allow the power of the gospel to bring about the change. We will see God do things in situations and people's lives that go against all logic and reveals to us all the good that God actually has for humanity and for his creation, for people. The opposite of exercising faith will be be trying to control everything around us. And in turn, instead of seeing God's goodness at work, we will be limited to only seeing what we can accomplish. 
And brothers and sisters, that's a far cry from having an understanding of all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? Thirdly, Paul appeals to that spirit fruit of love in Philemon. You're, he says, your authentic love brings joy, it encourages, and it has refreshed the hearts of many. Paul, Paul is hinting that that same spirit fruit of love would go a long way in encouraging and refreshing Philemon's new brother in Christ, his runaway slave, Onesimus. And fourthly, I see Paul reminding his friend, his friend Philemon, this wealthy church leader, this new believer, this new brother, this slave Onesimus would be capable of doing the very things that Philemon did for Paul in helping with the ministry of the gospel. That's what he says. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me with the gospel. A runaway slave and a wealthy church leader. Paul says, he can do for me what you could do. See, when we come to Jesus, we're all equal. We're equal at the foot of the cross. And yet, Paul still shows respect to Philemon and appeals again to love and grace rather than commanding him. Because where is the joy when someone does something just simply because they are commanded? It doesn't reveal the heart change. And Paul wanted to see that divine influence in Philemon's heart begin to be reflected in his life. And finally, Paul shows us the heart of the gospel as he's willing to be Jesus in this situation. I love this church. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Paul was willing to do in this situation to reveal the power of the gospel for salvation and what Jesus has done for all of us, for all people. If Onesimus has cost you anything, if he owes you anything, charge it to me. I'll pay the price. Jesus on the cross paid our debt of sin and rebellion, and he paid all that we owed. In church, he said, charge it to me. That's what Paul was willing to do for Onesimus and Philemon. Just charge this mess to me. I'll take it on. So what happened? What's, what's the rest of the story? Did Philemon take Onesimus back as a brother in Christ? How's the story end? We all want to know the end of the story, don't we? The trouble is we can't live to the end of the story without the surrender. Well, the story isn't over. Why? Because the gospel is still at work right now in, in 2021. And appeals to grace and authentic spirit, fruit of love, still have the power to reveal to the world the full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Sometimes, these cultural changes and adjustments can take centuries, but church, don't give up on the gospel. Don't give up on the gospel. <laughs> yeah, we got we to gotta talk about Onesimus, the runaway slave, the thief who was changed by the power of the gospel. Christian tradition suggests that Philemon received him back as a brother into his household and freed him and then Onesimus became a bishop in the church in Ephesus. It's the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel in our three main characters, Paul and Philemon and, it, and Ephesus, or Onesimus, impacted the church, which impacted the culture. Don't you love that story? 
Church, in closing, I'd invite us all, including myself, to think about this amazing little letter in the context of the 21st century. There are many social and cultural problems that don't line up with Christian principles. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, the church started out in the first century facing all kinds of cultural problems. And we were confronted with one of them in today's text, slavery. And the Apostle Paul, just like Jesus, didn't find solutions in railing against society, but rather he appealed to the power of the good news of Jesus Christ, and it had to start in the hearts of believers. It had to happen right in Philemon's own household, or it wasn't going to change the city of Colossae or Ephesus or beyond. It starts in the church, the believers. Imagine with me what the power of the gospel could do right here in upstate New York in changing our cultural problems. Think about it. If we're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for salvation for all who believe, we've got to start to think and dream and imagine what that could mean for all of upstate New York. Because if we, if we kind of quit dreaming about that, do we really believe that the power of the gospel is the hope? How is, how is grace, that divine influence in the heart, reflecting in the life, impacting our own Christian households. What about when our spouse sins against us and the laws of the land say you can end this relationship? Does grace, does divine influence in the heart reflecting in the life abound? How is authentic love encouraging and bringing joy to our parents and our spouses and our children and our siblings? Are we just too locked up with the many offenses that we've taken into our hearts because of, of rejection and controlling words and abuse, etc. And so we just choose to withhold life-giving love. And finally, we can and we do come up with a thousand excuses as to why we can't and shouldn't extend grace or why we shouldn't exercise faith and give lavish love and in all kinds of situations we find ourselves in. We justify that that, that just isn't going to work in our situation, don't we? Don't we? It's like you just don't understand my situation. It's not going to work. And brothers and sisters, that is such a social and cultural, and I would even say church normal, that I fear we don't even see it happening. And I think it's fair to ask, how's that working in our families, in our congregations, in our communities? How's that working for us? Or are we willing to say like Paul, anything that is owed, anything that is owed, any wrong done, whatever the offense, I'm willing to take it on myself. And I will pay the debt and let the offender off the hook. That's our choice. We withhold or we offer to pay the debt. Because we can't go back and change all the offenses. And that's the power of the gospel, brothers and sisters, that we don't have to go back and change because we can't go back and change what has been done and what has been said. Does that seem like a pipe dream? like an impossibility? I'm here to tell you today it's not. 
I actually saw that happen yesterday. I sat with Pastor Titus, Pastor Myron, Pastor Greg, and Jamie Zare, and Dean Mosier. We shared hurts. But most of all, what I saw was words of asking for forgiveness begin to flow back and cross the room, and an offering for forgiveness. And I saw postures that were, were not, not surrendered beginning to open up physically. I could see that. An openness and a freedom that was not there before that happened. It's the power of the gospel for salvation, for freedom, for openness, for joy for being able to go live life and keep living life, not locked up. Probably need to close, don't I? Brothers and sisters, we can can complain and campaign about all kinds of cultural issues, congregational issues, and we do. But that really has no biblical precedent. The power of the gospel for salvation comes in exercising our faith, first in our own households and our congregations, And that is the Jesus New Covenant model that will bring transformation to the world. Amen? Church, I don't know all of you. I know some of you a little bit, and I know a few of you pretty well. But I know that all of us are people. And we have these pains, and we have these offenses, just like Onesimus and Philemon. And I know that you know the the Scriptures, and that you long to be the church that God has called you to be. And yet there's things that keep us from doing that and being that. And as we close this morning, I'd just like to to share a, a passage of Scripture from Psalm 139. It's very familiar. Many of you know this. And the psalmist is saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Know me, know everything about me. Are we willing to say to God, Search me, and know me? All, all All that's in there. And test me and know my anxious thoughts. Wow, have we had a lot of anxious thoughts the last 18 months in 2020 and 2021. We see that just kind of coming out in the world, don't we? Anxious thoughts. And then he he says, see if there's any offensive way in me. If you have the King James Version, it says, see if there's any wicked way in me. And then lead me in the way everlasting. In the Hebrew, that word wicked has nothing to do with morality. In fact, that use of the word in Hebrew for wicked, I only found about two or three times in the Old, te- or in the Old Testament. The meaning is, what he's talking about See if there, search my heart, know my anxious thoughts, and see if there's a pain or a wound in me or an idol. A pain or a wound that's become an idol. In other words, how does a pain or a wound become an idol? 
It's because everything in my life I view through that pain or that wound. And it keeps me from seeing God for who he is. It keeps me from seeing the scripture for, who he is, for what it is. And it keeps me from seeing other people for how God has called me to treat them. See if there's any pain in me, a wound in me, that's become an idol, that stands between me and truth. That's what the psalmist is asking for. It's Ryan and Amber, right? Could, could I ask you guys to come lead us in that first song you sang to kind of close us out? Is that putting you too much on the spot? Well, as they come, I would just like us as a congregation this morning to ask the Lord. To ask the Lord to reveal in us any pains or wounds in us that have become idols. That keep us from exercising our faith. That keep us from experiencing the full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Is, is this making sense, church? I don't know how old you are, Brother Al, but why, why does it take us so long to get to this place of surrender? What, what are those things in us that just keep binding us up? As Ryan and Amber sing the song that I think almost had to be written because of the story of Philemon and Onesimus. As they sing that song, I'm just, I don't know how you normally do things here at Nomberg, but I know there's been some, tanks, some tension and some anxious thoughts. If you'd like to come up front and pray or have someone pray for you, just say, Lord, I don't want to carry these these pains and these wounds anymore. I don't want them to be idols in my life. Or maybe you've got tension towards a brother or sister here this morning, and you just need to go talk to them and give them a hug. Tell them you love them. Pay the price. Titus said earlier when he opened the service that September 26 is a new day. Let's have a new day for Nomberg. So you can be the church. It's, it's part of looking in the mirror and being ready to walk down the aisle. I don't know of any brides that walk down the aisle without looking in the mirror. In fact, they do it a lot. And they got other people looking for them, front and back and all around. So as Ryan and Amber sing that song, I just invite you, if you need to go to Sunday school, go to Sunday school or come up to the altar or go find somebody that just you need to have a conversation with. Sunday school will wait, lunch will wait. But let's just allow the Lord to minister to those wounds and pains in us that have become idols for us, that have locked us up. Did you guys share with us?
Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of all the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Your intent was that now, through the church, your manifold wisdom should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to your eternal, eternal purpose, which you accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nomberg Church, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, what... I would just say one more thing, whatever the Lord has been stirring in you this week, this morning, carry into the week. Jump in the car. You know what? Onesimus went a thousand miles to be reconciled to his brother. Can we drive across town? Can we walk across the aisle? Let's do it, church. Let's be the church. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Darren.